Well, Thomas, it's really good to see you again. I trust you're keeping very well. It's been ages since we've seen each other in person. Very true, very true, but uh, I'm loving life in Phoenix. Well, congratulations. So, uh, um, so look, there's a lot of talk about what's going on in the world of transfer pricing today. What is hot in the field of transfer pricing at the moment? Well, you wouldn't necessarily associate the word hot with transfer pricing, but uh, something that's uh, certainly top of mind for me these days are intercompany agreements. Hmm. And there are really three reasons why that's sort of top of mind for me. One is a prominent uh, court case. Uh, number two is an interesting article. And number three is technology. So let me just talk briefly about those three items. The, the court case is, uh, as you could probably guess, the Coca-Cola case. Um, you know, a, a sort of a really a, a seminal IRS win and um, a lot of interesting things in that case um, and a lot of interesting takeaways. But one of them is around intercompany agreements, uh, it really emphasize the importance of intercompany agreements, but, but not just generally the importance of having intercompany agreements, but very specifically thinking about the terms that you have in intercompany agreements. And, you know, I think historically, a lot of times the types of terms like exclusivity, termination provisions, et cetera, um, have been sort of really structured from a perspective of, you know, international tax considerations. For example, um, you know, we, we oftentimes without licensing of IP from the U.S., we want to avoid, um, uh, you know, the, the, the treatment of the IP as a, or the, the license as, as a sale from a U.S. tax perspective. So oftentimes taxpayers have chosen um uh, non-exclusive um, um, treatment of, of the license arrangements. Um, but that's not necessarily the right answer from, a, from an arm's length perspective, especially when we want the uh, licensee to bear risk. And, uh, and you know, licensees you know, will only be willing to bear significant risk if they have certain assurances like exclusive treatment. So um, I think you know the, 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 this case really highlights the the, the need to, to kind of you know be more strategic about how you think think through some of these terms and um, and it, it, it takes some sort of uh, balancing of, of different uh, transfer pricing and other tax needs against each other. So that's that's the one uh, the the one thing that sort of um, uh, makes us think about intercompany agreements. The second one I mentioned was an article, and it was an article that uh, was written by one of our former colleagues, Andrew Hickman, who, uh, if you remember, Rodney, he was a transfer pricing partner in our uh, KPMG UK, uh, formerly with Inland Revenue. And after he left KPMG, he joined the OECD and it became the, the head of the, the transfer pricing group at the OECD. And in that role, he played an important, um, a prominent role in, in drafting the revised OECD guidelines, which sort of elevated this whole concept of DEMPI. And that's become a big, big talking point in, in, in the uh, um, international tax and transfer pricing world, as you know, and the importance to demonstrate that you have um, sufficient substance to carry out the risk management and, and DEMPI functions that you're ascribing to an entity. But in this article, um, Andrew highlighted that this concept of DEMPI has been taken much farther than it was ever intended, certainly by the people that drafted the OECD guidelines. And in particular, that um, a lot of tax authorities and tax practitioners are almost ignoring the role of intercompany agreements and casting them aside and using DEMPI as a, as a standalone measure and transfer pricing method to, to allocate profits amongst multinationals, something in that in Andrew's wor uh, words was never intended by, by the drafters of the OECD guidelines. And, and so we, we, you know, this really resonated with me when I was reading that because I see that happening in, in, in real life. We're, we're working with clients where tax authorities are, are throwing around this DEMPI concept all the time and ignoring what the actual intercompany agreements are saying. So um, it, again, it highlights really the importance to stick by your intercompany agreements and ensure that tax authorities understand, you know, what those intercompany agreements are saying and, and why they are consistent. Um, um, with with uh, with the functional allocation between the related parties, and the third the third uh, um, reason why why uh, intercompany agreements are sort of top of mind for me um, is is as I mentioned related to technology. Uh, one one thing we know you know we talk to our clients about the intercompany agreements um, and and the importance of the terms and all the things that I just mentioned, but the reality is a lot of companies struggle with it, and because the reason they struggle with it, especially large companies, is because they have so many transactions and so many intercompany agreements. Some you know, very large multinationals could easily have thousands of intercompany agreements and it's hard for the tax department to stay on top of that. And um, um, 
so there's there's some really interesting technologies out there now that can really help with that. Um, technologies that that can you know um, you know read, if you will, for lack of a better word, intercompany agreements and identify the terms and really help automate. Uh, the analysis and the structuring and the uh, and the gathering um, of of intercompany agreements and intercompany agreement data to ensure that the tax department is able to understand what's out there, uh, because it is impossible to go through thousands of agreements manually. But now there's technology that can help tax departments to do that and to address some of the concerns that have come up uh, in the Coca-Cola case and the concerns that Andrew Hickman raised in his articles. So those are the three things, the case, the article, and technology. That's really fascinating, Thomas, because, you know, just given the level of M&A activity um, going on today, I guess this is a good reminder for folk to really pay attention to, do they know if they've got into company agreements? Do they know, and then do they, they know what they say, and then are they actually abiding by those? Because I can imagine this becomes a potential um, discussion point and due diligence otherwise, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, that's this is one of the pitfalls within our company agreements is, yes, you want them to exist. Yes, you want them to be clear. But but there's also such a thing in my mind where you can go too far with them. So I've seen in the company agreements that specify all sorts of terms and, 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 and actions that the parties will take. And it all looks great on paper. The problem is, you know, when that was put in place with the advice of lawyers and, and other people and everyone agree that that's wonderful and that's great. When you go back a couple of years later, no one's paid attention to the provisions mm -hmm. of the agreement. And the agreement might say things like the parties will come together and uh, decide on projects and sign off jointly on projects via committee. And there will be this action and that action. And no one's actually done that. And, and now in, in some ways you've almost made it worse because you have an agreement you say you say that agreement you know dictates the allocation of risks and and functions, but you haven't actually followed the agreement. Mm. So so now if you want to you know make the case to the tax authority that the agreements should govern the analysis, not their view of Dempy. Well, if you haven't followed the agreement, now you've just you know made 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 the made the case harder for yourself. So putting that thought into you know how much. Do we put into these agreements, and you know, is is a real a real science, and then staying on top of that, making sure that okay, whatever we put down, we're actually following that, um, becomes very important, and that's where these technologies can really help. Well, that's fascinating because I, that's just fascinating and a really timely reminder because I know that as we continue down the BEPS route, people continue to talk about DMP and perhaps are just plain forgetting the foundation of this being the intercompanies. Well. Thomas, thank you very much for your time. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm sure it's. I'm sure this area is keeping you very, very busy at the moment. Absolutely, Rodney. And I okay. hope to see you in Phoenix someday. Well, I really want to come down, believe me. <laughs> okay.